I also have a spiritual inspirations. Um, I think that was important for me in the process was to name this block, Madame Tower block. I made her a gestalt. It's a talk to. She could be in bad mood, she could be furious, she could have a good day or a bad day. So, so this uh, talking to Madame Tower block and sort of feeling, the feeling of having contact with her soul, sort of, was important for me. I grew up uh, actually just 200 meters from, from the tower block, so it, it, that, that building is kind of a, a part of my uh, childhood scenery. It was where we, uh, when we got our uh, weekly allowance, we went, uh, went to the kiosk at the tower block and bought our candy there. And also we were, we were using it as, as a playground. We were uh, going down in the, these uh, deep uh, hallways in, in the basement and we were borrowing these uh, bikes. And, and, uh, uh, also I had, had very strong memories from, from the tower block. Uh, I've uh, uh, said goodbye to both friends and uh, and relatives there. Uh, I have uh, sort of experienced moments of transition, death, birth, uh, healing, which in a way has written themselves into me. And the tower block has always, since I since I was a kid, it's always been there, and it's always been there. The hospital, the place you go to when you're ill, the place you. Uh, go to when you're going to die. When you tear down a huge structure which has uh, this immense uh, meaning uh, in so many different uh, levels of understanding, it's the whole townscape, the whole uh, memory uh, of how the city actually looks like for Trondheim. Uh, it is the most monumental, strongest uh, building shaping the skyline of Trondheim uh, and then I think we really need uh, to make a ritual. I gave birth in that tower block and I, uh, I have uh, almost lost someone or children in the... So I have, I've been in there and uh, for me also uh, to take part of this gives me it's 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 sort of a healing uh, process i think healing in a way that the memories came up to the surface and in a way i have been part of a project a performance an event that sort of could could take it down again and uh, i feel that now there are more peace to my memories. I think it, it made the audience really uh, experience that, that this building that many uh, have visited and has experienced and seen in the city, that it was really being torn down. I, th I think with, without the, the performance there on the, on the site, that many people would, this would go almost unnoticed. I've always been concerned about uh, the end of things. It's possible to understand that thing as, you know, the thing like the tower block, the building you see, but I think it's important to realize that the end of a thing is also a part of the thing itself. Everything has an end and it's a tendency uh, in our time, I think, to try to uh, avoid the end. We, like we, we, rather than uh, tearing down a building, we, we preserve it and put it in a museum. Rather than letting things have their natural end, we, we, we preserve them and, uh, and collect them. Either that or we just uh, throw them away and, uh, and don't give them a proper ending. Well, I'm an educated uh, liturgical uh, ritual studies I worked quite a bit with. And I've also worked as a pastor, minister, whatever. So I have buried quite a lot of people. So this is maybe my professional role in this project is to sort of contribute with, with my skills 
when the way I have been ritualizing and uh, been through a process that is somewhat similar to this, somewhat. <laughs> uh, for me it was kind of a happy uh, uh, event or uh, that I was really looking forward to and still I know that all changes uh, kind of is also to say goodbye to something old. This started with the memories of our themes that we published on the blog and then the blog was read and the memories came back. Uh, I really liked the idea of taking care of all uh, the memories uh, that had been in that building and in that regime in a way. Uh, when we had launched the website that people didn't um, they didn't rush to heyblocka.no to write their memories so we thought well what do we do we actually had to come to come to them and uh, and take note of their stories the urban city mission they serve there is a soup serving to people on the streets here in Trondheim there are also people that don't sleep inside during the nights or or some that uh, use drugs. We sat down by the by the by her kitchen table, and and she she told me about all these memories from her life, both as a kid and also, of course, in the tower block. And she was one of the best um, oral narrators that I've heard. She was really really uh, making everything so lively. So I went to that soup and I just got an open microphone and I asked, do any of you have any memories from being in the hospital and so on? And there were so much willingness in that room to share. She was so full of uh, life and vigor, even if she was 92 years old. And so it was really a great experience to sit there and, and just listen to her telling these, these uh, amazing stories some of them quite dramatic from, from the tower block and afterwards to just sit down in her salon and, and have waffles and, and coffee. And it was not a sharing about uh, what do I suffer of or what work do I have but an actual experience when I took farewell with my mom and we and they came and uh, washed washed her and what song we were singing and uh, yeah so on yeah and i feel privileged to be able to to focus on my own memories and on the memories of all the people in this city and that we sort of could collect it honor it respect it and then sort of close it down A red thread that goes through my whole professional life is uh, an interest in popular theatre, people's theatre, to make, uh, try to bring people as close to reality as possible. I thought it was when when this uh, the um, the rig came up, the stage, and with the lighting uh, and everything, uh, that whole area changed into a into a into a stage uh, with and the block was a, a scenery it was the most incredible uh, uh, scenography the 20th or 31st of january mm. when when the performance event actually happened that is a very strong memory and that marked something mm. in, because then there was something before and something after and I I can still have the song Alta Sintid When the went is there and, and the performance and the way it was made it always transcends the planning of course it's, it's a new thing and uh, then it became uh, incredibly important that it was done because it was so much dimensions in it, a spiritual dimensions, that actually no one could sort of predict. The process um, 
Well, for me, the process, uh, in a way, started when first Barbara told me about her idea, and I thought, yeah, that's a good idea. And from there, it was a process of uh, a lot of uh, different <laughs> qualities. <laughs> it was a project that, uh, in a sense, it couldn't be done. It was impossible to do it, because it was, well, far out. <laughs> this being in the middle of this furious, uh, demolishing, uh, noisy, aggressive process without knowing. It was uh, chaotic, it was uh, still very focused, it was uh, constantly on the edge of not being realized. Even if I thought it was, it was crazy, I thought that, wow, this <laughs> could be some journey to, to join. It was quite a, a, a very interesting uh, gang, or what should I say, interesting group of, of different, uh, very different people and very different uh, backgrounds, different ages, and, uh, and uh, everyone had something to contribute that was, that was sort of unique. For them. It was an interesting experience to, to enter the project uh, at the point where I, where I came in. Because I, I think I s saw the project somehow from, from the outside. And I saw that it was many, yeah, many um, uh, balls in, in the air. <laughs> and. Uh, Somehow, uh, they, these these balls were supposed to to land. Being in that process was, on the one side, very educating, but also, uh, I have to say, uh, a very stressful and uh, kind of the crea creativity of crisis, because we always run into a crisis where the project was always everything was almost about to um, uh, fall apart. And we had to come up with a solution, and then a solution came up, and the project had, in a way, changed. And I think to be calmful in this uh, situation was the greatest challenge, I guess. She was open to let it take its own shape, so she didn't really try to force it into something uh, that she already had made up her mind about, even though. At the beginning, she had quite uh, specific plans, and we developed these plans into a quite a specific concept. It's like uh, not having so very strong ideas about what you should do. I think mm. it's more like sitting and waiting and see what's happening. And when something, I would try to say that leadership is about to give life to what has life already, and and don't try to put life into something that's not alive. Some uh, months later it was all very different and a few weeks after that it was totally changed again. So what we ended up with had a sort of relation to the original plans but it always uh, evolved into something different. The building was so much greater on the day that you actually could do it. So all these occasional, uh, all these things that happened uh, uh, and how time worked into the project and actually developed it and made it much greater, much more interesting than what we could plan. When we had the last rehearsal for the, for the show, uh, that was uh, the day then that we could uh, I try out the, the technical side of things and uh, and also make the decisions on what to show on the on the building. Actually, it was delayed until the um, the last rehearsal. So the episodes during the two and a half day of rehearsal that we had, when the second day turned into a winter storm. And by directing, I felt like I was Amundsen and Nansen on their way to the South Pole or something, and everything was 
the technical equipment was uh, rolling away and the tent flew and we had to do the rehearsals inside the hospital. I think I thought about that this was Madame Torreblock. She didn't want to give in. She didn't actually want to be buried. And therefore it was very, so it was her last furious attack on us. So, so I remember I, I was lie, lying on the floor in the car that we used for the... Um, for having the uh, projectors to be dry and everything. And it was a total snowstorm outside and everything was blowing <laughs> here and there. And but then we uh, kind of also saw that uh, yeah, the images that we had chosen, they were, they were working actually, and we got a nice image up on the, on the tower block. Yeah. And Barbara was happy <laughs> as well. And uh, when the Sunday came and we were going to, to have the performance, it was totally peaceful and it was snowing and the block was there, but no. Suddenly it was without a soul. It had actually turned into a ruin. It's like the rest of the process for me when I found very powerful metaphors. Uh, my process is sort of when I found the metaphor of the blue block or the dramaturgy of vulnerability or I found during the process these metaphors and the memory molecule is one of those metaphors. And this metaphor is sort of focusing and empowering the process. And the idea of the molecule is like uh, there is uh, that every memory is a sensuous experience. And it's like the at uh, molecules, they attract some specific molecules and not others. And when you start to sort of uh, open this molecule, it evolves, it's a sensuous experience that you evolve. I tried to grasp what, what this uh, concept uh, meant when I entered the project. And I understood that it was some kind of tool to, to bring the, the <laughs> creative process further and to, to to make this universe that the uh, Tower Block project was. It was meant to explain this process of uh, typing in uh, the memories and the experience and giving it a shape. I remember one of the first meetings that me and uh, Boybro had uh, during the project. Uh, the first or the second maybe. Then during the conversation the word memory molecule, uh, molecule uh, just popped up. There are so many things that I remember from this project that, that, I, that are strong images in my mind, uh, voices, music, uh, the actual building. It's just an instant. And of course when you, 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 you're trying to express this instant, you have to kind of pack it into something, you have to pack some context into it. But I find that you really need very little context to, to tell a story. Uh, I think that the memory is something that, uh, for very many people, for me at least, it's, uh, it's uh, as much about, it's more about the smell, and the touch and other kind of kinesthetics and vegetative uh, sensuous experiences we have. And, and the molecule is sort of uh, a point in your body you can contact. It's like a focus point you can contact. And when you push on it or nub on it or sort of touch it, it, it evolves. So it's like a pattern of molecules, that memories are some kind of pattern of molecules that is your own molecular structure. It was very much my experience when I was walking around in those empty rooms in the, in the tower block, how I sort of touched something. I couldn't really, 
for example, I, I, I was uh, taking some photos in, in the area of the building where the kids hospital had been uh, in the 70s. And I'd been there as a, as a child. Uh, but I really couldn't remember what had happened there, but th I, I, re I, I sort of touched something. I touched, uh, by, by entering that room, I touched a, a little piece of it. And by sort of walking it through, I, I could unfold more and more of uh, what had happened there. Uh, going these places, I mean, into the tower block, well, it, it triggered uh, associations that uh, made me remember more and forced me to, to put it into words and to, to uh, give them some kind of shape. So, so the idea of the mem memory molecule that in a way touches an essence of a certain memory or something that is going to be a memory. And uh, usually memories, they're, they're just there. They can kind of, they can um, come to the surface uh, at some occasions. You get a, a kind of flashbacks, but then they kind of dive back into the the, the big pool. Uh, the memory is um, eternal and it's like an ocean and, and it's like just letting it out. The last time I saw my, my grandfather alive uh, and I told about that moment in a sort of um, in a little movie we made and I sort of made a performance out of that telling that memory and what I realized is that by giving the memory a specific shape, I, I don't tell, I don't give, I don't tell a story about a memory I already have, but in telling it, I'm creating it because before I, I told about it, it wasn't really, it didn't have a shape. I, I went to the website and, and also wrote mine, so that made me give the memory a really a clear shape that, that shouldn't uh, add anything to, to what I kind of, the, the images that I had in me. Uh. So I, I realized it was very important for me to get it right when I was telling the memories. I, I couldn't uh, compromise in any way because my telling of the memory became my memory. So that performance in a way uh, on that day when we made that movie was it, it turned out to, that that was going to be my memory my personal memories from the from the hospital i I tried to preserve uh, I was encouraged uh, to write memories um, in the in the blog and so on but I found that I actually I wanted to have a, 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 some distance to 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 this. So I uh, I I am a little afraid of telling memories. I realized after I have told it uh, a couple of times that I, I I shouldn't be doing this anymore because I in a way my telling of the memory would uh, repress my connection to the situation I was remembering.